Thank you very much. Well, in fact, uh, my background is uh, I first studied uh, industrial engineer. Uh, and when I finished my studies, I discovered that it was not my vocation. <laughs> because uh, I realized that uh, studying industrial engineer, they didn't, answer, they didn't give me an answer to the main problems that, uh, that concern me. For example, why in the world there are rich and poor? Why there are nations that progress and others not? And then I start working as an engineer, but uh, at the same time uh, I studied economics. Uh, when I finished economics, uh, I was at the 33 years old. And I start working as an economist, and I work the, as an economist the rest of my life. But I've been also an entrepreneur. And, uh, I founded from scratch five companies, and one of them or two of them, this one is very small. Uh, I am still working in, in those companies. Well. Well, the index of my presentation, I will talk a little bit about what's the knowledge economy and uh, then about principles and theories of wealth creation in the knowledge economy, who creates wealth and how wealth is created. Then uh, I will establish very roughly the relationship between wealth creation and competitiveness. And that will be the theoretical part of my speech. Uh, after that, I will deal with <coughs> methodologies and frameworks for diagnosing competitiveness or wealth creation potential of regions and nations in the knowledge economy. I will talk a little bit about uh, which are the methodologies for diagnosing wealth creation potential in the knowledge economy, very briefly. And uh, then using the principles and theories and wealth creation and the methodologies, I will try to reflect a little bit on the crisis of pain, of pain which are the causes that what can be done in order to overcome the crisis. And finally, this more, I will give some ideas of the future challenges for our community. There's the intellectual capital and knowledge-based development community, which are the future challenges for intellectual capital and knowledge-based <coughs> development community. This, that the latest part will be some words on the scientific challenges for our for our career. <clears throat> well, the advent of the knowledge economy, we are entering a new age, uh, an age of knowledge, in which the key strategic resource necessary for prosperity has become knowledge itself, educated people, their ideas and innovation, and their entrepreneurial spirit. All this is the main, these are the main features of uh, the economic and social context in which we are living. And the only certainty is that everything is uncertain. <laughs> and, uh, but there is one certainty, is that the long-term trend towards a knowledge-based economy continues driven by the growing globalization of knowledge. This is, in this uncertain world, this is the only certainty. And uh, when we talk about knowledge economy, what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about, uh, according to the definition of the OECD, uh, Knowledge economy is defined as a state of economy where wealth creation is based on the production, distribution, and use of knowledge and products based on knowledge. Well, everybody knows all that, but uh, 
because it's no, the knowledge economy is a matter of proportions, if we consider the four uh, factors of wealth creation in the knowledge economy, uh, that there are labor, capital, land, and knowledge, uh, and we divide, if we divide the history of the mankind into three eras, we see that in the agricultural era, this was the proportion of the four factors. Then in the industrial era, the proportion changes. And then in the knowledge era, that's our era, then the knowledge has become the fundamental, the fundamental <coughs> factor for wealth creation in our economy. That's the reason because our economy is called the knowledge <coughs> economy and our society is called uh, knowledge society. Uh, and the four main concepts that we will use in the knowledge economy are data or ideas, information, knowledge, and I introduce another concept because everybody of us has a lot of knowledge in his head, but not uh, when we talk about knowledge economy or knowledge management, we are not talking about uh, the whole knowledge that we have in our head. We are talking about knowledge that produces value, and that's called intellectual capital. That's called intellectual capital. But uh, there are other definitions of intellectual capital. One is knowledge that produces value. Intellectual capital is synonymous of intangibles. Uh, there is another definition that intellectual capital is another and other intangibles that produce value. Other intangibles could be emotions or could be commitment or other intangibles. Another definition of intellectual capital could be uh, intellectual capital uh, is equivalent to core competences or core capabilities. That's the same definition you use uh, this morning. And uh, usually in the in intellectual capital community, intellectual capital is considered the, is considered that uh, it has three main constructs within, there are three main constructs within intellectual capital, human capital, structural capital, and relational capital. Well, in these three factors, uh, there are intertwined and, uh, and they produce value. In the intersection of all that, they produce value. There's a little bit of theory, of knowledge, and intellectual capital. Well, that's the process of value creation. And now, Let's go to the second point, the <coughs> principles and theories of wealth creation in the knowledge economy. Well, uh, in the knowledge economy, at the micro level, there, is, uh, there are many theories, uh, especially derived from the strategic management theory, there are the ones that you have here on the left-hand side, and at the macro level, there are several theories here. Uh, and, uh, the more recent theory at the macro level is the knowledge-based development theory. And at the micro level, there are knowledge-based, is the knowledge-based view that complements other theories. Uh, and uh, base, these are my contributions my, in terms of methodologies to the micro level, and these are my contributions in terms of methodologies at the macro level to the knowledge space development and to the intellectual capital theory. But I, I will not continue this way because uh, we don't have time for all that. The pillars of the knowledge-based economy are 
according to the World Bank, an educated and entrepreneurial population, a dynamic information systems infrastructure, an economic and legislative environment that favors information and telecommunication technology, knowledge transfer and entrepreneurship, and an efficient innovation system. Research networks, triple helix, etc. Well, these are the pillars of the knowledge base economy. And let's go to the theoretical principle derived from all this body of theory that I've been, uh, I've been mentioned uh, uh, before. Uh, who creates wealth? Uh, the first principle is in a market economy with inclusive political and economic institutions is the sine qua non condition for sustainable economic and social development. <coughs> this is very important and in order to explain that principle I will need probably one hour. <laughs> But, but I will try to summarize, but it's very important. Uh, a market economy, there will be a free market economy, and with inclusive political institutions, that means political institutions that include the totality of the population, democratic political institution inclusive. Not political institutions, there are a mafia that is dominating everything, and the rest of the people may decide, they decide nothing. No? This is the, imagine some countries like in Latin America now, Venezuela, that's totally opposite of the conditions. They are not the right condition for, uh, they don't, there are not uh, democratic. Uh, political institutions so that the, this economy in Venezuela has not the right uh, political institutions yes. for uh, knowledge, for knowledge based uh, development. And the second principle that is also very important, you have all these principles in my book Entrepreneurial Excellence in the Knowledge Economy that has been published by Palgrave Macmillan and the ones that will come next Monday, I will give you a flyer and information on the book, but here yeah, we don't have time. <laughs> the second principle is wealth and poverty of a specific nation is strongly dependent on the number of competitive or excellent company <coughs> that the specific nation has. The more competitive or excellent companies a, a country has, the more competitive is the country. Yeah? A country that has no companies because the companies die or because they are not competitive, uh, so the country is not, is not, com uh, is not competitive. Uh, government does not create wealth, but contributes to, facilit to facilitate or to hinder wealth creation. And... Uh, an excellent or competitive company is the one that achieves long-term extraordinary profit due to the fact that it has a business model with sustainable competitive advantage. In the knowledge economy, sustainable competitive <coughs> advantages are mainly based on intangibles, and the main intangible is knowledge. Mm. Uh, in order to achieve business excellence, a strategy perspective is the key one. And now we know who creates wealth. And how wealth is created with, is always the same. Wealth is created by companies. Not all companies create wealth. Which companies create wealth? The excellent of competitive. And is always, wealth is always created with good strategy formulation and superior strategy implementation. And another important thing to consider is that good strategy formulation and superior strategy implementation is always a human task and strongly depends on the quality of top management team and key professional people. That's, there are the key persons in a company that contribute to create wealth. 
well, and the other principle, you know, continuous change in environment, business model are quickly get out of date, and innovation in a business model becomes an urgent need. In any company, the essential activity to perform is always innovation in the business model. Companies alone do not create well. They need the collaboration of other companies, universities and research institutes, financial institutions, government and other organizational institutions, and especially the existing ones in the cluster region or nation where the company is located. In other words, they need to be active part of a territorial open innovation system. A company in order to create well, they needs to be part of a territorial open innovation system. And of some authors like to call knowledge-based ecologies. And finally, at the macro level, this is the, the last principle. Uh, in principle five, we state that strategic management of intangible or intellectual capital is a fundamental task for gaining and sustaining competitive advantage. We refer mainly to companies, but at the macro level, same way that at the micro level is, ne is absolutely necessary nowadays for succeeding <coughs> companies, uh, is absolutely essential to strategic management of intangibles or intellectual capital. At the same, the same way at the macro level, we need strategic management of intangibles for cities, regions, and, and nations. Well, well, summarizing all that, we see that people that are the ones that create wealth with the knowledge, each time more scientific and linked uh, with research and development, also with intangibles, not only brain but also heart, and uh, also working in competitive enterprise and that at the same time they need to be innovative and located in this suitable environment. Huh? That, that is, this is an old one that, uh, do you remember when we were in Sofia and Tivoli? Well, the uh, relationship between wealth creation and competitiveness, uh, I skipped the uh, def competitiveness definition, but what is important that that's, uh, this citation from Stefano Garelli, nations themselves do not compete, rather they are, their are enterprise do. Nations uh, also compete with brains, and uh, what says My Michael Porter, that is very important, it is well understood that sound fiscal and monetary policies, a trusted and efficient legal system, a stable set of democratic institutions and progress on social conditions contribute greatly to a healthy economy. These broader conditions provide the opportunity to create wealth, but do not themselves create wealth. Wealth is actually created in the microeconomic level of the company. That's wealth can only be created by firms. Wealth can only be created by firms. And more than 80% of the variation of gross domestic product per capita across countries is accounted for by microeconomic fundamentals. So that's the relationship between competitiveness and, and, and wealth creation. Well, I now I will talk a little bit about which methodologies and frameworks uh, we have now for diagnosing competitiveness or wealth creation potential of regions and nations in the knowledge economy. Well, there are three sets of frameworks. The competitiveness frameworks it probably most of you know, you know. That's the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Index and the IMD World Competitiveness Yearbook. There is the Knowledge Based Development Framework from the World Bank that has a methodology called Knowledge Assessment Methodology, quite useful in order to determine uh, uh, the wealth creation potential 
of uh, any, any economy. And in our community, because uh, Gunther and I, we belong to the IC community, we have uh, some IC community frameworks, mainly based on Scandia Navigator, and I try to develop a methodology that's called NIX, NIX means Nations Intellectual Capital Benchmarking System, that tries to integrate all those methodologies and consider the micro and microeconomic dimension. Uh, the classical methodologies that are used in many economic studies now, uh, they focus only on the <coughs> macroeconomic dimension, they then consider the microeconomic dimension. So Nix tries to integrate both dimensions. <coughs> well, the 12, these are the 12 factors of competitiveness of World Economic Forum. The IC community contributions, this is the, the variables of IC community contribution, the human capital index, process capital index, market capital index, renewal capital index. Uh, classic economic analysis uh, uses only or measures only mainly tangible assets, uh, gross domestic product, uh, balance of payments, and, but uh, in any, in a modern economy, intangible assets has to be measured, and these intellectual capital models at the macro level measure these intangible, these intangible assets. Uh, this is my framework, and uh, that you see it's very complicated, as you see at the first glance, but there is the human capital base, where there are the people that, these are all the, <coughs> all the macroeconomic uh, factors that give to the system macroeconomic stability. And in the upper part, there are the clusters where, the, where we have the economic activities and there, where there are the companies, there are the ones that create wealth in an 80% proportion that we, have said, that we have said before. So wealth is really created in the, in the upper part where there are the companies and, and the clusters. But uh, the human capital base is the base of everything because there are the people that create the companies and manage the companies and produce the products and sell the products. And, uh, and we will try now to analyze, considering the body of theory I have explained and using that methodology we will try to reflect on the Spanish, on the Spanish economy. Well, well, I have, that's okay, no? Well, well, Spain is a country that <laughs> is, <laughs> that, uh, now is in the, in the EU and also is in the Eurozone, yeah. like you. <laughs> uh, being in the Eurozone, uh, uh, we have uh, different rules of the game we are playing. It is not the same to be in the EU and not to be in the Eurozone than being in the Eurozone. The Eurozone is like the Champions League of football. <laughs> and uh, in order to be competitive in the Champions League, you need to have a very, uh, very good uh, team. And uh, like uh, Barcelona, where I live, <laughs> or, <laughs> and very good players. And so the human capital has to be very good. And also, and, and at the same time, <coughs> at the, same time the, the club has to be very well, very well organized. And, uh, and so we need competitive, very competitive companies, excellent companies, and excellent, excellent companies requires uh, excellent human capital. Mm -hmm. 
and we are we are in that in that eurozone so we have here european union countries well gross <coughs> domestic product per person different indicators that uh, i will skip that but this one is very important is the unemployment rate no? so in spain is leading well that's that's that was 2012 at that time we were the leaders now is greece the leader no but uh, <coughs> that shows that those companies that have this rate of unemployment uh, that means that the human capital that's the base of the, the economy we have, we have a lot of people that don't work uh, and in particularly in Spain we have 60 million to uh, unemployed uh, people employed people people they pay the social security legally employed the total population of 47 million people. That means that in Spain only work 34% of the total population. That's awful. We will discuss a little bit that issue later on. Well, uh, the youth and employment rate, that's, it's practically the same. The average youth and employment rate in Spain is at that moment is 55, 55%, so that's awful. But in terms of knowledge-based development, having people that are not working is awful because they have no practical knowledge, have no intellectual capital, because intellectual capital is knowledge that produces value. Maybe those people, they have studied, but if they don't apply, never apply what they have studied, so this kind of, popu this kind of population, uh, in practical terms, uh, uh, for, uh, in terms of uh, creating wealth, they don't create wealth, and their capacity of creating wealth is diminishing uh, every, every, every day. <coughs> well, the budget balance, uh, well. So, what happens in Spain? When wealth is created, we have now 12%, the construction was 12%. Now it's diminishing industry 17%, services 68% in the primary sector 3%. And that's the Global Competitiveness Index of Spain that is considered from the world economy. There are all the different factors. Spain is considered innovation driven. So we are in the group three of the Global Competitiveness Index. And you see here the main intangible factors that determine competitive, competitive from Spain. And that's the present, the present situation. We don't have time to analyze all that, but uh, the most problematic factors for doing business in Spain, according to the World Economic Forum, are access to financing, restrictive labor regulation, inefficient government bureaucracy, insufficient capacity to innovate. As you see, most of those factors are intangible factors. In this case, these intangible factors, there are not assets, there are liabilities. <coughs> and uh, this is a little bit more a description of the Spanish crisis. The Spain problem is tied with the problem of the entire European periphery, the boom years following. I will not read to all that. I will skip that and I will concentrate on the three bubbles that the, the Spanish economy has built uh, 
in the years before the crisis started. Uh, since the year 200, when they enter in the Eurozone, till 2007, practically. And we build three bubbles. One is the real state bubble. Uh, there is the mother of all the battles. <laughs> And the real estate bubble, at the same time, uh, produce a financial bubble, or the, the first one produce the other, interrelated, and that produce the, the state bubble. That means that the, the government of municipalities, autonomous communities, even that we create a, a bubble, also a third bubble. Then, with the crisis in 2007, the, the bubbles burst, and uh, now, well, <coughs> there is the, the housing prices that has been falling. That's a little bit what was uh, the, the worst part of the, the Spanish crisis. Some not. This is the worst part of the Spanish economy. This is a better part of the Spanish economy. Uh, so some good aspects of tourism. Uh, and in these aspects, in, in soccer, we are very good. We dominate uh, in tourism and soccer. We are very strong. That uh, those economic activities. Uh, at the same time, the bubble produced uh, a lot of underground economy, and uh, we were the country that we had in <coughs> circulation uh, the biggest number of. Uh, of 500 euros notes, a lot of corruption also, yeah, a lot of corruption. This is the map, the, the Spanish map of uh, corruption that links with the political, uh, <laughs> the political <laughs> institutions. No? And that is, uh, is a liability in wealth creation, in wealth creation. <coughs> well, and, and uh, I will now try to summarize the situation in Spain with that, uh, using the metaphor of that, that vessel. Hmm? Well, uh, that's the government of Spain that commands the vessel with a total population of 47 million that uh, 12 years ago was a population of 40 million but with the bubble and the artificial progress uh, 7 million immig uh, 7 million people come from immigration to, to Spain yeah? so these are the engines of the vessels, there are the four sectors, construction, primary sector, service, and industry. Uh, we have, we were organizing 17 autonomous regions, you see. And uh, there is uh, a real state bubble, and the bubble burst. Eh? So we lost the main engine, the main engine of the vessel. And now, the problem is uh, which economic activities we will put here as the new engine in the future. And have to be different kind of economic activities. We, we, we need to rebuild the economic model. And at the same time, the vessel has many holes, uh, and we need to fix all these holes. Hmm? Uh, 
the, the main calls were public debt and deficit, labor reform, and financial system. Financial system is <coughs> is really is now in much better situation and has been fixed, especially the worst part of the financial system. Uh, a labor reform has been done, but public debt in deficit is not completely solved. No? But the main, the main issue from the point of view of uh, knowledge-based development is that we have lost 20% of limited companies in this period from 2008 to 2011. And we said that companies were the ones that create wealth. And we have lost 20% of them because of the crisis. Most of the companies in the main economic activity that we had, that it was the construction and real estate business. And at the same time, companies, in order to be competitive, they have to be innovative. And we have 13,000 innovative companies. And in order to be a knowledge-based economy, we will need 40,000 instead of 13,000. And the investment on research and development, we have 7 billion investment and we will need 14, 14 billions. So that means that uh, we are not really a knowledge-based economy. Uh, at the same time, the underground economy accounts for 20 or 25 percent of gross domestic product, depending on the sources you pick up. <coughs> We have 26% employment and 55% youth unemployment. And our foreign debt is 1 billion. Uh, 1,630,000. 1, well, that's 1 trillion, 670 billion. <laughs> And the total debt is that one, and the net external debt is that one. So the, the, the economy has very big debts, uh, impossible, impossible to pay. How much is it in the USA? Yeah, sorry? The net external debt, how high is it in the USA right now? So? United States. In the United States. How high is uh, the, the United net States? External the United debt? States. Uh, it's it's really well. Well, that that figure compare that figure is worse than the United than the United States. But the United States is very high. It's very high. <laughs> uh, it, it, it will be necessary to now because the, these are total figures. It will be necessary to distinguish between uh, companies debt, state debt and uh, individuals that yeah. there are but that but we don't have time to just to, but the united states is not in good uh, is not in good situation so yeah. japan is worse yeah, yeah? No, japan, yeah. japan is worse yeah japan. japan no no japan is the one that it depends on we we are considering japan is the one the, the worst one because especially the public debt in Japan, in Japan is nearly two times the, the, or more than two times the gross domestic debt. In Spain, the problem is not now. The public debt is the private debt, the private debt as a consequence of the economic crisis. Well, but this country in fact, is all supervised by the International Monetary Fund, the Central the European Central Bank and the European Union. That means, and uh, what happens is, the, because there are no jobs, many people take these small boats 
and emigrate to Dutchman, Italy. That probably will be the trend in the future of the Spanish, the Spanish economy. The trend. Well, that's the so the way out of the crisis in the Spanish economy is something structural. We need to change the economic model. We need to change the economic model. And uh, uh, thinking philosophically, the current model features are a weak primary production, 3% of gross domestic product, construction hypertrophy, 12% of gross domestic product, industry and energy production, 70% of gross domestic product, that basically focuses its export on the car and its parts. You see, our main industry in Spain is the car industry. But all the car industry, there are factories, there are in the hands of uh, Volkswagen, Ford, uh, the owners are, they are not in Spain. But based on models of second technological level, that's what is bad for, for Spain and for the knowledge economy, for competitiveness in the knowledge economy, they are not, they are based on second technological. Finally, services concentrated around tourists and the public sector, there's 68%. And what we will need theoretically in order to become a knowledge-based economy more competitive, very selective agriculture, very important industry with low environment cost focuses on exports because they are advanced technology, not too much construction, and especially many more services of high value wealth. But that's what we say in English, in a chimera. It's difficult to achieve in the short, <laughs> maybe in 20 years' time, we, we, it's possible to achieve that. <clears throat> well, these are the reforms you need. And so the future of economic, uh, the Spanish economy, it's a kind of, it's like that. So we thought that we were in the Champions League, and we find uh, we finally realized that we were in the club of pigs. <laughs> do, do you know, Jose Maria, that in Canary Island they have a special pig that is, uh, is original, I forget, that is black pig. Oh, yes. <laughs> that is something so that you have to put in the next. We have to take yeah, to the, like, to the, yes, the pigs in black for the Canary Islands presentation. Very, 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 very rich meat <laughs> in the black pig. Yes. So, you can introduce in the pig. So, that's the, the tunnel that uh, in which we are, no? And what we will see in the end of the tunnel is that kind of landscape. <laughs> Or maybe, maybe this one, maybe this one. I don't want to be uh, too yes. pessimistic, too pessimistic. But obviously it will not be the landscape of Switzerland. And then uh, I would like to stress some special issues that an analysis from the knowledge-based development perspective requires. It's the analysis of human capital, which human capital we have in Spain. Uh, the human capital base focus on what people know, what they do, and what they can do. It's about people knowledge and current economic activities. But the problem is, as many people in Spain, they don't do economic activities. They are working in the underground economy, uh, doing low skill activities, or there are or they are unemployed. What they can do in the future is strongly dependent on what they know and especially what they are doing now. And uh, the related uh, in relation to the clusters and micro clusters where wealth is actually created, uh, we need to, what I say here is main economic activities where people are working 
and which are developed in the so-called clusters and microclusters, knowing the core activities and the core competences and core capabilities of the main firms in each particular cluster, as well as the cluster competitive environment, give us light on the nation's well cash potential. So we need to analyze in which clusters and which economic activities and which are the main competitive companies that could be, that could be the seeds for future for future economic development. Apart from the things that we can invent, but that's more difficult because uh, uh, the usual thing is to build on our own strength, on what to really what we will, what we really have now. And uh, finally, the last the last point is future challenge for the IC and knowledge based development community. And there are I divide this last uh, slide in three parts for diagnosing the situation. Uh, refining the nixes in which I am working now, framework for an in-depth diagnosing of the nation's actual knowledge driven competitiveness foundation and complementing the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report that is really very good with an in-depth analysis of the human capital base and the cluster and micro clusters were really, really created. So in order to analyze a specific country, uh, I arrived to the conclusion that uh, the best we can do now with the available information is to rely on the World Competitiveness Report and complementing the World Competitiveness Report with an in-depth analysis of the human capital and the clusters and the micro clusters. Uh, then another important issue is for visioning the future because if we need to move for a while from our present economic model to a new economic model in the future. So uh, we need to vision this future and helping to give an answer to the two fundamental questions in which economic activities will Spain excel in the future. Nobody knows now. Eh? Uh, this week I attended a conference in, in Barcelona uh, last Wednesday and the governor of the Bank of Spain, that's the maximum authority in, in Spain in economic, in economic policy, and uh, somebody asked uh, what we will do in, in Spain, which economic activities we will do in the future, uh, which, uh, in which economic activities we accept, and he had no answer. So the government doesn't know what we are going to do. Which will be the, which will be the economic the economic model in the future, uh, and which competence and capabilities must be developed? That this gives uh, an answer to what uh, in which of the, the, the issues you raised this this, this morning, yeah? and helping to design this economic model is very important. For a region, is exactly is exactly the same. And for managing the transition from the present economic model to the future economic model, choosing the right methodologies and framework for managing the transition to a more innovative, competitive, knowledge-intensive economy. There are many tools for managing the transition. The most difficult is to diagnose the situation and visioning the future. And many thanks for your attention.